The Texans thrashed the Steelers this week, and this episode of the bullpen is going to be all about that. We're going to talk about how great CJ did and where his ceiling's at. We're going to talk about injuries, injuries, and injuries because the Texans seem to be enduring a lot of those. And we're going to be talking about how great the defense did this week. All that and more on this week's edition of the bullpen. Hey y'all, I am James Roy, and this is my partner in crime, my co-host. He's back this week, back from vacation. Tom Chavaria. Tom, how are you doing today? James, I'm good. I'm glad to be back. Glad to talk about this Houston Texans team. The Bahamas was amazing. I've got junk all over my apartment. Don't even, didn't even have time to get it together because I, I was so excited about this game, and we need to get into it. No, yeah, we actually got to sit uh, together on the PSF app. Here's a quick plug. We're co-hosts on the PSF app, pro sports fans. We live stream games. We talk about the Texans over there too in the Texans chat room. Highly recommend you download the app and join up. And it, if you consider yourself um, more of a super power awesome fan, um, that we got a designation for that. We'll, we'll get you signed up and set up to be a power fan on the PSF app. But Tom, before we get into it too deep, where, uh, if you don't mind me asking, where exactly did you go? You said the Bahamas? Yes, yes. It was a cruise to the Bahamas. We had three different stops, Freeport, uh, Half Moon K, which is a privately owned island, I guess, by Carnival, and then Nassau, where uh, if you've never been there, uh, Atlantis is a, is a resort there, and you could spend a week and not do everything. The place was amazing. The water was amazing. The weather was amazing. Uh, I got a little sunburn. I got very brown and had a really good time. Nice. I'm glad you got a little rest. My, I did one cruise in my life ever, and my favorite part was that I found one restaurant on the boat. It was like all you can eat, whatever, and I just ordered like a hamburger and a piece of cheesecake, and I did that like 30 times a day. I was like 16. It was the first time that that was ever something I could do. I was like, I'm going to eat as much as I can, so I, I bet you had a lot of fun. You probably did more than just eat all you could, but no, yeah, so let's get into Texan Steelers. We obviously um, watched the game together, and it was an amazing thing to behold. Uh, I had a lot of uh, Steelers fans coming at me on Twitter saying, uh, the Texans ain't it. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a mutual exchange between the fan bases. So leading up to the game, I was, I was showing a lot of respect to the Steelers defense because of what they've been throughout my lifetime, the history of the franchise. And a lot of Steelers fans were saying that they were going to thrash the Texans based off the history of the franchise, what the Texans have been at, at least very recently and for most of their existence, which is just not very good. Um, and, and I've seen plenty of Texans Steelers games where it, it just didn't go like it did this past week. And I know you can relate. So it was it, to me, it was quite the revelation, almost to the same level as if we like beat the Patriots when Tom Brady was playing like that was like, OK, this doesn't happen. This is this is an exciting time. And, you know, and the only to me. Going into the game, I had a lot of confidence the Texans could win um, because the Steelers' coaching situation is really their the ma most major positive outside of T.J. Watt and that defensive front. So, I, I mean, I just want to go back to before the game and then and then reflect on after. So, for you, what were you feeling going in, and, and how was it confirmed, or how was it not confirmed? Well, for me, I felt like the Texans had a chance. They played very well the week prior in Jacksonville. However... I'm also very aware that the Texans hadn't beaten a Pittsburgh Steelers led team, or, or I'm sorry, uh, a team led by, uh, I'm struggling with the name of the coach right now. Mike sudden. Tomlin. Mike Tomlin led Pittsburgh Steelers team. Thank you. Since 2011. So we're talking 12 years. JJ Watts, a rookie season, the last time the Texans were able to get it done. So initially thinking, well, this is something that the Texans don't do, they don't beat this team. They're so well coached. They don't beat themselves. They walk into your building. They take it. They take the crowd out of it. Which, if you haven't been to a Steelers Texans home game, it's probably 60, 40 Steelers. They're, they travel so well. The terrible towels are in there going. They're full throat. It's definitely a home environment wherever the Steelers go. They're just they've been doing it that long. That's that it's that kind of team. So with them having that atmosphere and 
obviously playing well. The the coming into to the to the game, they're two and one. Uh, they'd beaten a couple teams. The only loss they had on their record was to the Niners, who some people feel is the best team in football. You kind of expected the Steelers to do well against a Texan team that nobody expected to do anything. And and the Texans have kind of come out of the gate. And I want to acknowledge what you said. I I agree with you. It's a very different vibe for me. I, and I I picked the Texans to lose against the Jaguars, but. A lot of my hope was sourced from the understanding that the Texans historically usually beat the Jaguars. It's like a, a common thing. And so going into this matchup, it was surprising to me. I was, was really, it wasn't surprising based on how the Steelers are. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, this is the Steelers. So like I, Kenny Pickett's not a great quarterback and the offense you know, is kind of trash, but, but they could do something. They could come in and beat us. And so I was, I was genuinely surprised at how little they did against us. But speaking to, the game itself, um, we couldn't get through this discussion without talking about C.J. Stroud. Um, and and I, I mean, I feel like I already gave my my two cents on um, before and after the game against the Steelers. So let's get into talking about C.J. Stroud. I want to get your thoughts just just right away, just out of the gate. What what is what is your first thought when you think of C.J. Stroud? He's. Definitely something I don't even think the league knew was coming. When when you look at C.J. Stroud in the draft process, there was never a question if he was going to compete with Bryce Young as the number one pick. I mean, I think there was a, a it was a moment in time where people thought that you could fall in love with him. At, you know, the 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 build. He's more of a prototypical quarterback. But the consensus leading all the way up to the draft was that Bryce Young was was the dude, and everybody else got in line. And now, four weeks into the season, people, national media, local media, the, the sports talk radio here, 610, 790, 97.5, didn't matter what you listen to, they're, they're all talking about C.J. Stroud and how amazing he is and how he's arrived and the presence that he has. You know, initially, he said all the right things and you felt like some of that was kind of coach speak-ish, like I'm supposed to say this. But when you see him play, he really embodies what he's saying. You you see him. There was a play where he went to John Mechie in this game. John Mechie wasn't able to make the catch, and he went over, pulled him over on the sidelines, like, hey, I'm coming back to you. These are things that, while you may say them to the national media, you don't necessarily expect him to do that in a game. And you can tell he has a genuine relationship with these players. He's he's absolutely uh, fell in love with his team. And, and he rides and dies for them. You know, you see the celebrations. You see the way they're just gelling. And I can't say enough things about C.J. Stroud. I'm glad I got him on all my fantasy leagues because that was one of those moves that I made, you know, at least the money ones. I've got some that, you know, I don't have them. I think the one with, that we do for the Texans, I, I don't have them. But I got him everywhere, and I can't be happier about my pick. No, yeah. And, and so I guess I'll have a little discussion from my perspective. My biggest – thing with cj stroud right now to Te- tearing it up incredible 1200 yards uh you know uh, just an amazing st- both statistically and the eye test just really it-, it pops with cj stroud but my biggest thing is is that so this past week literally after this game was the first time that i've outright said like cj stroud is a texans franchise quarterback like for, to, the, to the point uh to this point prior to that i was just saying that he's progressing taking the steps and will be and then now he is, right? And so I guess my biggest thing is is I don't want to build myself up too much and let myself down. Um, I'd say this is very similar to how um, when someone gives you a survey and they say, hey, can you rate our service on a scale of one to five? You know, five being perfect. And you go, well, I'll give you a four, but I would never give a five because I just don't believe in perfect, right? So I find myself suffering from a similar feeling here where I don't, I don't want to go all in on C.J. Stroud. I, I feel like it's really early, and I feel like if I, I'm, I'm going to set myself up to be let down. But the other part of me, the the part that I listen to more, um, is, is telling me, tell, scream it from the mountain. C.J. Stroud could be the MVP this year. Like he, forget offensive rookie of the year. He is playing MVP level football right now. And and I actually put out a video earlier where I said that, and and I at least mostly kind of believe it. Um, I, I mean, when you look at what Stroud is doing so far, these numbers, and, and I've said this about a lot of his attributes, these aren't just impressive for a rookie. CJ Stroud is impressive for a quarterback in the NFL, like just in general. To remove the rookie tag, CJ Stroud looks great all around in 
in in ways that elite quarterbacks look great. I I mean ball placement, accuracy, pocket presence, on the move, making decisions, uh, and making the players around him better. He does all of it well, and those are all trademarks of an elite quarterback. So I mean I I, I my hesitancy is there in the back of my mind, but I think I'm moving past it. I don't know. Do you think it's too early to like go? This is the franchise quarterback. He is the future of the NFL. I don't. And and the reason I'm going to say that is because normally when you have those those conflictions, it's because you're worried about a part of the team. You're worried about the team being able to support a guy like that, right? We felt we felt similarly about Deshaun Watson, or I say some members of Texans fans felt the same way about Deshaun Watson. The first four games he showed up, he tore it up. However, you you were always worried. Well, can they protect him? You know, we've had quarterbacks where they couldn't protect. Well, is the, is the head coach going to do enough? You know, we've had head coaches that didn't necessarily do enough. We've had you know different different areas of of a team where you're like, well, he can only go as far as the rest of the team. When you look at the rest of this team, however, when you look at Bobby Slowick, when you look at D'Amico Ryan's, when you look at the players they've went out and acquired. When you look at, at what they still have available to them as far as capital from the Deshaun Watson trade, there is so much positive thing. There's so many positive things surrounding this young quarterback who just turned 22 yesterday. It's it's really hard not to want to go. Wow, you know we we caught lightning in a bottle because there there everything's set up perfectly in place for him to succeed. I think you have a young, hungry team, a young, hungry fan base that is that is starving for a winner, and he recognizes that. So for him to be gracious of the position that he's in, for him to understand what he's doing at 22, I mean, how do you not scream it from the mountaintop, as you said? I, I agree, and I think it's a good segue into our next topic. Injuries, injuries, injuries injuries i could say it a million more times it would not be enough times to capture how incredibly impactful injuries have been on this texan season um knowing what i know now i mean i could say that that that's probably one of the big factors that adversely affect the texans gelling earlier in the season and getting that chemistry together um to beat the ravens and the colts and that's why i'm not near as worried about the colts matchup later in the season as i was coming you know off of that matchup um but injuries have been huge and the offensive line particularly has been a hot spot for injuries. Actually, this week, we found out that Kendrick Green, the O-lineman that has started three games for us um, at left guard, uh, is now has torn his meniscus and will be out indefinitely. So that's another injury. But there are players returning this week, like Titus, or sorry, not Titus Howard. I didn't mean to get your hopes up there. Laramie Tunsil has been confirmed to be returning this week. And, uh, you know, we've got Juice Scruggs and Titus Howard who are eligible to be designated to return from IR and could be back this week or next week. There's no confirmation on that yet. But I think that the offensive line position is a perfect microcosm that shows us why what C.J. Stroud is doing is so impressive and why him being three or four games into the season is not um, as big of a factor as it should be, because if he if he's behind his his number one O line and he was just doing good all year, you're like yeah he's good, but like when when the bullets are flying, how is he doing? Um, I would say the only thing we haven't seen from CJ, not to detract from our transition away from talking about CJ, but you can never talk about CJ too much <laughs> on a Texans podcast. The only thing we haven't seen from him is a come from behind victory, um, and so that di- that day when that happens, it's going to be a big day. Um, Cause I know it's going to happen, but I, I mean, how do you feel about the offensive line before my big question? Here's what I'll set you up with. Okay. The, the offensive line is going to recover and we're going to gain players back. It means we're going to still have a constantly shuffling offensive line. Do you think chemistry is what has made the offensive line play well the past couple weeks? Or do you think that we just, we just had some good games, some good matchups, and we should rush, you know, to get the guys that are injured back so that we can have our starters and we can play our best, you know, players in offensive line. So I believe injuries are are they happen to every team. I believe that has the Texans have seen more than their fair share of injuries this season. And I also believe that that only highlights what CJ's been able to do. 
but not only from from the offensive line standpoint, you got to keep in mind they were missing their two safeties at wet points in the first two games. They played this last game without their number one draft pick shutdown corner, who's going to be out for a while. I mean, there are holes everywhere. It's it's not just. I mean, they they have linebacking issues where they're they're missing linebackers due to injury. The offensive line is, is important to CJ, absolutely. But for these team wins. You know, we talk about uh, how they could have gelled sooner. They didn't have their whole, uh, they didn't have their whole box of of toys to play with to begin with. So these injuries are are racking up. However, I believe that they have the right system in place with the right leadership in place to play the. And I hate to use the the term, but it's so common: the next man up mentality. They that they're, they're just plugging and playing. I mean, when we talk about some of these guys that are that are holding down these positions, it, you don't know if those guys would even be in the league right now. I mean, that's where they're at. But credit to this uh, head coaching team or head coaching group, credit to all the guys around them that are just trying to make this thing work because who knows? I mean, a lesser team – would be 0-4 right now, and and you'd be able to point at the injuries. And this team is like, now nah, we're not going to do it. We're just going to keep out, come out, keep fighting for each other, keep grinding. And they, they look really dangerous. And I'm glad you bring up next man up because um, it was interesting to see. my Whenever I think of next man up, I think of that hype video the Texans made for TJ Yates back in like 2011, 2012, when we made our first playoff push. And, you know, Arian Foster's like, you know, TJ Yates is not the third string quarterback. He's our quarterback. And I was like, okay, dude, cool. But like, we all know that like, that's not what you really think. And so, you know, and, and obviously I'll, I'll love to TJ Yates. TJ Yates in my eyes is a Texans legend for his contribution to the franchise at an important time when they needed him. Um, but looking at this team, you, you heard D'Amico Ryan say earlier, I'm glad you brought it up. He said, oh, it's next man up. And it's easy to look at him and be like, that's a cliche. You're saying that. You don't mean that. But to watch the team back it up and do that over the past couple of weeks and just be like, okay, well, I guess I guess Austin uh, Declis is going to be playing left tackle this week. Okay. Hope no one, you know, is good enough to rush past him like, you know, the Steelers defensive line. But he stepped up and played his game. We have, we have had plenty of players step up and play their game. And I'm glad you brought up defense because – there's a, the, a, the flip side of it is is that there were players that returned from injury. Jimmy Ward's on his second week back, but Jalen Petrie returned, and we saw his impact right away. Um, I think we can make a direct correlation between defensive injuries being more detrimental to the team than the offensive injuries. I think that the offense is figuring out how to, to deal with injuries and that the defense, I hope we don't lose the safeties again all season because it seems like having our safeties back is what has catapulted this defense back to what it could be. And and that makes sense. Coming into this season, the secondary was the group on the defensive side that seemed like it was the most surefire, like, yes, this is this is the group that is going to carry this team. And who would have thought that Steven Nelson would be heading up that unit right now? But which injury do you think, like, returning from was the most impactful on the defensive side of the ball? It's tough because either, you could pick either safety, and I think that's not a wrong answer. When you look at what Jimmy Ward was able to do his first game back, you instantly saw his impact. And then I think when you look at what Jalen Petrie did his first game back, you instantly saw his impact and how much those guys are terrors on that side of the ball. I think Steven Nelson is the biggest benefactor because now he's getting to be – or he's getting more uh, advantageous situations – because of what those guys can do on the field. And you saw it in the pick that he had uh, on Sunday. So it's interesting. I, I feel like the answer is Petrie, but I don't think you can knock what Jimmy Ward does. I love them both. I love what they bring. I, I love both of, both of their games and how they play. I love the when they brought Petrie uh, off the edge and he, and he had that, that TFL uh, midway through the second quarter. I was like, that's, that's what they've been missing. You could see it. Like that, that was... Uh, that changed that whole drive, shut it down, and we're going the other way. I really feel like he's the guy for them. He, he's a tackling machine. He, he cleans up so many mistakes. Jalen Petrie for me. I think I, I agree with you. I think that this week Jalen Petrie's return was impactful. I would say 
So last season he had 147 tackles, and that's a lot of tackles for a safety. And I felt it as someone who's in a dynasty IDP uh, league. I, I got him off waivers, and he has been nothing but amazing for my team from that perspective because tackles are worth a lot in uh, fantasy football. But I, I think more so than his ability to tackle, which has been questionable at times, um, at least last season, but more so in my eyes than his ability to tackle is is his the aggressive attitude he brings. With, with D'Amico Ryan's bringing in the swarm to the Houston, a guy like Jalen Petrie is a tone setter. He's a guy who steps on the field and you see him play and you go, oh, dang. It's like uh, that scene from the other guys where it's like, oh, I thought you said bad cop, bad cop. And I was like, how am I going to top that? I got to step up. I got to I gotta be more aggressive than Jalen Petrie. Like, how am I going to do that? And his influence can be felt across that defense. I think a lot of the rookies and a lot of the younger guys, um, it, which, I mean, Jalen Petrie is, is one of the younger guys, but, but a lot of the guys on that defense, you know, there's a reason he was named a, a team captain. He, he has that influence. And so having him back on the field was major to me. And another aspect of the defense that stuck out against the Steelers was Henry Toa Toa not only being downhill, you know, a, a lot of, of the talk on him leading up to the draft and one of the reasons he fell is he's a, a little undersized as a linebacker, but he's very aggressive and he can sniff out a play and he's downhill. But also being a little undersized, a little more agile, um, there was a couple plays where he dropped back. He made that one pass deflection in the end zone. And I was like, dang, dude, we, we really got something in Toa Toa. Um, and I think that him stepping up, is, ooh, right, he just dropped something. I was like, oh, what was that? Um, him stepping up in the absence of Denzel Perryman has been great. And when Perryman's back, I think that, that Toa Toa is still going to command snaps because of how much he contributed while he was there. I mean, I don't know. How do you feel about Toa Toa's performance? You noticed it too, right? Absolutely. I love it. I love the Alabama connection. Him and Harris, Christian Harris, I believe they played together at Alabama. So you know they, they obviously gel right away when they're both on the field together. Love what Denzel Perryman does. I think he's he was a great addition. However, I think he's there to groom Toa Toa to be the the heir apparent. And uh, I think when when Perryman comes back, you're just going to have so much depth and you're going to be able to keep those guys fresh and rotate them in. I think that's going to make that defense be able to swarm like they want to that much more because you're going to be able to rotate guys in and out and not lose anything where normally you bring your second, third string guy in and, you know, the defense takes a step back. I don't think that's the case with this defense. I think it's going to have tons of depth, which I I'm all for it because that's going to keep them fast. I mean, I feel like for me, like having played Madden a lot growing up, you know, you play Madden and you play franchise mode and you just go through and in the draft, you're like, you know, from, from round one to seven, you're like, these are all guys that are going to play. I'm going to pick guys from the university I like at the position I like, and then he, I'm going to play him and he's just going to get better and he'll eventually be the start, like good enough to be the starter. And so I feel like that's what we're getting right now from the Texans is like, oh, this is a rookie. He was picked in the sixth round. Okay, here you go. Now, now you are our starting center. And I'm like, okay, well, this gives me a lot of hope for like Xavier Hutchinson, um, who's a guy who I was already pretty high on uh, when he gets his chance being able to step up and actually, you know, do, do his thing in the game. Um, but I guess I, oh, there's one last thing I want to talk about before we kind of bring this episode to a close. And that is, your your biggest takeaway from the game, just broad spectrum. It can be what you, what they improved on, what what you think is the biggest thing we we learned or gained moving forward. And I'd like to start with you on that one. I think for me, the biggest thing I learned about this team is that Bobby Slowick can absolutely dial up some plays. When you looked at this uh, this Pittsburgh defense coming in, and you looked at a guy like T.J. Watt who had six sacks in three games. You felt he was going to have two, three, maybe four sacks. You didn't know. And credit to Bobby Slowick and that offensive line to come up with a game plan, come up with a scheme to keep him at bay. They didn't register not one sack all day. And, and if you'd have bet me all the money in the world that the Texans were going to do that, I'd have took that bet and I'd have lost all the money in the world because I've been like, there's no way this team is going to keep the Steelers out of that backfield and keep them from putting C.J. Stroud in the ground at least once. And yeah, I mean pregame. If the over under is two and a half sacks, I'm contemplating the over, but I'm but I'm taking the under. I'm like I'm 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 going to show some confidence, but I am contemplating the over. No, I agree with you. Bobby Slowick showed up, showed out. He 
Um, and honestly, what it is I, for me personally is, is that I feel like we're getting more and more of the playbook each week. Um, I felt like that, that halfback pass from Devin Singletary was amazing. Um, and, and I can't wait to see more things like that, more, more trick plays, more. Once we open up the playbook, I feel like the run game will stand to benefit because that's one thing that also made a huge jump this week was Damian Pierce and, and uh, Devin Singletary. I, honestly, looking at both of them, um, it, it was more what I expected to start the season where, it, where Singletary is finally getting his work. Um, and even though, even though we're not seeing the, Dev, uh, the Damian Pierce that we wanted at the beginning of the season that's running for 100, 120 yards a game and crushing it, you know, we are starting to get closer to having a backfield that's putting up 100-yard rushing games which is really what is the important part. For me, the biggest takeaway has to be d- defensively. I didn't say that because you went with offense with yours. I'm, I'm totally coming up with this organically on my own. But I personally have been someone historically who's believed. I think that the Texans tr- uh, coaching staff when Gary Kubiak was hired was the ideal coaching staff. You, you hire an offensive-minded head coach, and then it really came into its own when they, when they hired Wade Phillips as a defensive coordinator and those are the years Bulls on Parade, and those are the best years of the team, and that's because, in my mind, the head coach calls the offensive plays, and you get a really good defensive mind to make sure that he doesn't have to worry too heavy about the defense while he's leading the team. Um, so this was a little different than what I was expecting or than, than what I would usually go for. Um, but, I mean, I was all for D'Amico Ryans coming in and being the coach because of the nostalgia aspect and because I, I you know, having a great defensive coach, it can, it can work the other way. Um, so watching this game, my biggest takeaway was that, you know, and I, I think I alluded to it earlier, it, as this team has recovered from defensive injuries, I think it's been more impactful um, on the team, the injuries on defense than on offense, um, which is a good thing. And I think that the defense is what is going to make C.J. Stroud great. Um, we're, what we're going to see is, is the first game that the defense, like, really just takes a dump and just doesn't show it. Because each game, the defense has to some extent mostly shown up to play for most of the game i'd say the colts game is the worst defensive performance we've seen so far um and that was just two really quick bang bang plays and it's and the offense kind of didn't help that with the quick turnover um but until the defense just absolutely doesn't show up just like you know we play a, a really good team which is not possible we don't have any good teams coming up on our schedule and, unless you count the cincinnati Bengals based on the previous year um you know, a good team coming in and just absolutely decimating the defense right away, and the defense is just on, you know on their back from the start of the game. We'll see C.J. Stroud play well until that happens. And so, I, I mean, I I have noticed that's my biggest takeaway from the game is that the defense is it wins championships. I've always believed that, but you know, D'Amico Ryan's and what he's doing on the, there over there on defense is what's letting C.J. Stroud do what he does on offense. Um, I yeah. I think the one thing that I that I would like to say to that is that with this offense in this last game, you saw a, a, a true balance where you were able to see you didn't see CJ chuck it 44 times. You know, they had it was more like a 30-30 type deal. And if you if you go back to that Colts game, the Texans spotted them 14 points, but the Texans also went three and out twice and and didn't give the defense time. To you know, I think I think having that balance, having that comp- complementary football, like they like to talk about, where if anything you're flipping field position, if anything you're you're doing a four or five six minute drive, something of that ilk, is what's made this all kind of gel and all kind of work. And as much as you said, well, the defense hasn't really had one of those games. I'm I'm sure we will look at one of these games going forward and go like, well, the defense didn't show up. However. I feel like if they're going to be able to keep this balance where the offense is going to be able to have long sustained drives, you're going to see a defense that's going to be hair on fire because that's the embodiment of the coach. I don't think they're going to not show up to play. I just wonder if maybe the offense struggles one game and that's where the defense doesn't look its best. And, and, and I've, I said it earlier, I'll say it again. The one thing we haven't seen from Stroud is a comeback victory and that's a big a, a defensive thing or really his, maybe you could say it was the inability to come back from behind against the first two teams, but we haven't, we haven't seen that. And those two games kind of felt like at, you know, at points they got out of reach. Um, I'll acknowledge that much to the chagrin of some Texans fans who felt like the Colt game, Colts game was always in reach. I will say I, there was a point where I was like, eh, I mean, we, we fought back in, but there was a point where it was out of reach. So 
I, I'm interested to see CJ lead this team on a comeback drive because um, I, I've always felt that hopelessness when, you know, it could be a game where it's like 17 to 14 and the Texans get the ball back with two minutes left. And, you know, you know, with CJ, if that situation arose, I would be like, oh, yeah, let's go. OK, I'm, I'm excited to see what CJ does because this offense is humming. But, you know, last year I, we, we'd get the ball back with a one to three point, you know, difference in score. I'd watch a team come back and go up on us and then we'd get the ball for like one last two minute drill try and I'd be like okay well the game's over pack it up and that's the difference in this team is that and one of the reasons that I felt like this team is not a, a, a four or five win team is that this is not a team that you know in those close games just gives them up this, this is a team that that I believe can enter those situations face that adversity and come away with a win we might see a couple where they don't due to inexperience, but I mean, I, I have high hopes for what this team can do. Um, that that about brings us to the end. We might do final we'll do final thoughts here in a second. I just wanted to say um, we're testing a new format, guys, for those of you that are following the bullpen. So you'll notice we didn't talk about the Falcons-Texans game, and that is because there will be another episode later this week. Excuse us if we're wearing the same clothes for that episode, but... Um, but there will be another separate episode that will release later this week um, where we will be talking about the Falcons Texans game and focusing more on that um, felt like it might be a better way to give a more comprehensive look at each thing. So Tom, do you got any, any final words for, for the crowd before we, uh, before we take off this, this entire city, this entire fan base is absolutely charged up by the progression this team has made in such a short amount of time. Everybody had faith in D'Amico Ryans. Everybody, I feel, had faith that C.J. Stroud could figure it out. They didn't think it would happen in four games. And right now, the national media is caught on. There, there's a lot of local media that's caught on. And they, they, they're they realizing that this kid is for real. This team can be for real. And I'm excited. I think you should be excited, too. Incredibly excited. I mean, watching the Texans jump from like being ranked in the 20s to being the, the highest I've seen the Texans ranked on a power rankings is 11. The lowest I've seen is 15. Um, it, it is a wild swing. I, I'm here for it. Bring it on. Bring on the public perception that we're good because now teams are going to prep differently for the Texans. It's going to be good stuff. Um, if you're liking what you're seeing, if you follow us and you go, hmm, I wonder where we can find these handsome gentlemen that that talk about the Texans. I'd like for them to be on my phone screen more often. Um, we're on social media. I'm M1 Texans fan. Tom, you're third coast Tom. Third coast Tom. Third coast Tom is over there. Um, the YouTube channel is under N1 Texans fan. So if you search at M1 Texans fan, you'll find me and then you'll see a playlist that says the bullpen and you can, you can click in on that. Um, so go ahead, like, comment, subscribe, whatever it is you do. We, we appreciate the support. That you guys give us because um, even though we love talking about the Texans, we also love the support of you guys because that makes us love talking about the Texans even more. All right. So until next time, go Texans.